Hi everyone, it's Mandy here. Welcome to Yachting International Radio. And today I'm super happy to introduce you to Dr. Brent Sistermans, who's an extreme medicine doctor. He's um, sitting in Hobart, just about to jump on a on a, I was about to say ferry, on a ship down to Antarctica to be a doctor down there. And he's also an expert in mountain medicine and has done numerous trips to the Himalayas and Everest as a doctor too. But without further ado, how about you introduce yourself, Dr. Brent? So good to have you on the show. Thanks, Amanda, for having me. Um, it's, yeah, fantastic to actually talk to uh talk to your audience uh it's, it's a bit funny having been locked in isolation now for two weeks and not really having had a chance to speak to many people so yeah because uh, you're quarantining to go to antarctica aren't you so you've been in that, that hotel room that we can see for two weeks yeah that's correct so i'm heading down with the australian antarctic division um on board the mpv everest uh, which they've hired for this season because their uh, their new ship the noyena has been delayed uh, as a result of COVID. So they've hired the Everest this year. So I find it uh, quite interesting that I've previously worked on Ever on Mount Everest and now I'm going to work on the MPV Everest. So it's kind of a nice circle there. So, yeah, well, uh, as a part of our uh, management plan and risk reduction plan for, for the COVID pandemic is that we all had everyone heading down to the Antarctic stations this year had to go into pre-departure isolation uh, for two weeks. So... Just completing that now, um, and then yeah, head, get to head onto the onto the uh, ship tomorrow. Great. And how long is it going to take you to get down to Antarctica from Hobart? Yeah, so we're heading to Casey Station for a resupply voyage, uh, and it'll take us about ten days to get down there, depending on what the ice is like when we get there. Right. And so, you are you going? Are you a ship's doctor and a doctor on the base, or what? What's your role exactly? Yeah. So uh, this trip, I'll just be heading down as the sh as the ship's doctor, um, mm -hmm. and so just on a return voyage. And how many people are on the ship? Yeah. So uh, again, because of COVID, we're doing things a little bit different this year. So we're not taking down our regular scientists and things. So it's just really the tradies that are going down. At, um, maintain the station over the course of the winter so most of the most of our uh, team has actually already flown down because we've got a an ice runway uh about 80 kilometers inland from casey station so um a lot of the team have flown down so we're really just accompanying the vessel down uh for the resupply so it's got all the supplies for for uh, casey for the season uh so we've got 24 um antarctic expedition is heading down and then there's the the ship's crew as well and I think again that's sort of around the 20 mark. Amazing and what sort of um, what do you expect to be happening on the ship is there a hospital um, will you be doing appointments or will you just be kicking back kind of in your cabin in isolation again for another 10 days what happens? So for the first two weeks on board uh, so basically even for the entire trip down to uh, Casey we need to maintain social distancing uh, and we'll be required to wear masks and gloves for the entire time they're outside of our cabins. Uh, we're going to have um, uh, staggered meal times as well to try and uh, decrease the amount of traffic through the galley at any particular time. Uh, so that's going to be a little bit interesting so it's going to be a little bit lonely. Um, from a medical perspective, you know, as, a, as an expedition doctor, um, a fantastic expedition for uh, my clients or uh, the people that I'm looking after is a boring expedition because you don't want the doctor to have an interesting expedition because that usually <laughs> means something's gone wrong and they've mm -hmm. had to. So um, I quite hope that we're going to have a boring trip south um, and I'm just going to get to put my feet up and, and enjoy things. So uh, the Southern Ocean, as I'm sure a lot of uh, people listening will be aware of how ferocious the seas can be. So I've got a few first time expeditioners heading down. So I'm anticipating a bit of seasickness in the initial days. Um, and then, you know, we'll be loading things off and on the ship. So I'm imagining that we might have a little bit of trauma associated with that. But I'm hoping that everything goes smoothly and that I have a boring time. Uh, you asked about clinic times and things. So we'll probably just um, have a have a set half hour or hour a couple of times a day where people can come and find us and then the rest of the time we'll just muck in with everyone else and get on with the work. Cool and um, what's what's your uh, favourite trick for seasickness? What do you give them? What are you using? Can I ask? Yeah so we follow the uh, Antarctic 
um, or the AA, Australian Antarctic Division uh, protocol. So they like to use uh, Avamine or, or Finergan uh, as their first line. Cool. Yep. Which is something that all of you guys watching on the Super Yacht should have in your medical kits <laughs> as well, yeah. for sure. And um, how about ginger? Have you ever been a fan of ginger? I, whenever I'm on the boats, I see ginger everywhere. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's one of those over-the-counter things where uh, people can certainly get behind the idea of taking ginger. There's not, I don't think the evidence is really there. Uh, yep. But I think one of those things where it's probably not going to do you any harm. So if it's going to make you feel a bit better, then you can go ahead and take it. And um, one of the best ones I've ever heard, and I actually saw someone recover immediately from it, it could have been psychosomatic, but apparently if you put cotton wool in the ears, it makes a difference. We didn't have any, so we used toilet paper. So this chef was walking around with toilet paper hanging out her ears, but it seemed to cheer her up. Have you heard any evidence about that? I've, I've not, I'm not familiar with any uh, reviews about toilet paper in the years, I'm afraid. Uh, the captain at the time, um, who might, might have been a relative of mine, said it was cited evidence and swore by it, <laughs> <laughs> being a masterclass mariner. So let's yeah, talk about absolutely. the mountains. I want to hear, I spent, we all spend so much time at sea level and there's so many, many of us yachties are really keen mountaineers and, and many of us dream of, um, you know, of Everest, of Nepal, the Himalayas. Tell us, tell us, how did you get into that and what do you do when you're there? Yeah, so I work or I volunteer for an organisation called the Himalayan Rescue Association. Uh, they've been going for almost uh, 50 years now. Um, they've got a couple of, they've got three clinics in the Himalayas, um, one at Menang, which is on the Annapurna circuit, and that's just above 3,000 metres, and that's just basically the last big town before you pop up and over the pass and down the other side. Um, and then we've got the Ferrochet Clinic, which is at 4,500 metres, and that's on the main route uh, up to Everest Base Camp. Um, and that was established by the Japanese back in the 60s. Um, and we still send uh, international volunteers there a couple of times a year um, over the main uh, trekking and mountaineering seasons just to look after the, the locals because obviously a lot of uh, Nepali flood into those communities during the trekking seasons to uh, make their money for the year, uh, along with the, the trekkers and the mountaineers that are passing through those regions. Um, and then they've got another clinic, which a lot of people may have heard of, uh, known as Everest ER, uh, which was set up back in 2003 uh, by Dr. Luanne Freer. Uh, who's a US-based emergency physician. Um, so I worked at Ferrochet in 2017 uh, and then at Everest ER in 2018 and then I was due to go back there again this year. Uh, but unfortunately, the Nepali government in their wisdom uh, cancelled the mountaineering season two days before I was due to fly out. Uh, so nobody got to summit Everest this year. So um I guess that's probably a good thing. So we limited the, the number of people bringing in bugs from overseas into Nepal. But, um, you know, um, the Mount, climbing at Mount Everest uh, constitutes about 8%. The last time I uh, looked at the numbers of Nepali's GD, gross domestic product, is from basically climbing Mount Everest. So that's a huge um, impost on the entire country um, that they've, they, they've lost the money that comes from that. Wow, that's huge. Um... And so have you, um, have you summited Everest? Have you done it? Yeah, no, I haven't summited Everest. Um, it's, yeah, it's something that I would consider doing, uh, provided that I ticked off a number of boxes beforehand. Uh, you know, I, I've, the highest peak I've, I've, just, I've climbed is just over 6,000 metres. Um, I'd like to climb a 7,000, a 7,500, maybe another 8,000 metre peak and then think about Everest afterwards. But um, I'm not, I was never, I was never a climber that sort of went, yeah, I've got to climb Everest. It was just, um, it's, it's, yeah, and it's not even that it's sort of there. It's, um, I think I'd prefer to climb on the other 8,000 metre peaks and uh, it's a little bit quieter um, and to avoid those crowds that we see on Everest each year. Yeah, for sure. And um, tell us about the, this um, charity you work for as well. Like where do they get the funding from? If any listeners are thinking, oh, wow, I'd really love to support them and I'm, I feel passionate about that part of the world, 
where do they, where do they yeah. get their money from that for, to host such an amazing service there that you know is so needed because we've kind of overrun the place and and there's a lot of infrastructure there needing attention so how, how yeah, so, can we support it so yeah absolutely so the Himalayan Rescue Association um, basically the way that they work is they sort of have a bit of a, a Robin Hood type model uh, whereby as a Westerner or as, as an international tourist traveling through that area, international trekker or climber, uh, you're charged um, to basically have medical services. Uh, and then we use those medical services to, uh, or we use that money that we, that we earn from uh, treating uh, overseas patients to treat the locals for very minimal cost. So uh, in Nepali, we still charge um, because what we find in medicine is that if you charge people even a small nominal amount, they will take that. They will they will much more appreciate that service that you that you're providing. Whereas if you provide something for free, they take things for granted. And I think we sort of see that in the Australian healthcare system to an extent, which is a free healthcare system. Um, so we charge only you know fifty rupees uh, to see a local person, so fifty cents for them to come in, which you know, even even for um, um, even for a subsistence farmer is not a lot of money uh, for yeah. them to come and see us. Then we charge, uh, for medications, we probably charge locals less than the, what they would actually pay in Kathmandu. Uh, for an international person to come and see us, it's about US $65, uh, which is still, if you think about how much you pay to see your local doctor back in your own country out of pocket, even in Australia, we'd pay uh, more than that to see to see a good GP. Uh, yeah, well, it's US, 70 euros here for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And in the US, you'd be looking at seven hundred dollars to see your family physician or an emergency department. So uh, it's even you know it's cheaper to see us in Nepal than it is to see people in their home country. So um, you know it's, it's not a huge amount that we do charge, uh, and then that money that we do charge is able to go a long way with the local population. Um, That's and of course, amazing. We, and then we also sell some merchandise, you know, t-shirts and jumpers and things that um, people can buy when they come and visit our clinic. Uh, and that all helps and people can make donations as well. So, Great. I'll get you to get give me those links and we'll th- put them below so if anyone's feeling inspired by that. And where do you get your medicines from? Is there any way, I'm, um, yeah, is there any, do people donate it or do you have to buy them there or can you get uh, yeah, secondhand yeah. medicines? Yeah, so we, predom- we prefer to buy our own medications locally because that means that we can um, ensure the quality. Uh, mm-hmm. We do tend to a lot of uh, donations and things. So say at the end of the Everest trekking season, people coming, Everest mountaineering season, uh, people coming back past the clinic at Ferrochet might drop off uh, any medications that weren't used over the course of the season. Um, That of course then means that we need to go through them all, uh, make sure things are still in date because even though Nepal is a very poor country, you still need to use medications that are in date. So anything that's out of date gets thrown out. Um, and then, of course, we have the different uh, the problems with language as well. So um, uh, the HRA predominantly works in English uh, mm-hmm. as well as uh, so if things are outside of that and there aren't any doctors that speak uh, the language that the medications are in, well, then we don't really know what it is. So it has to get turfed as well. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. And um, what keeps you going back? What, what do you love the most about it? I mean, there's, 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 there's a lot of things to love about Nepal. Uh, firstly, the local people are just an amazingly friendly and the Sherpa culture is just amazing. Uh, great, great people to work with. Um, and then, of course, just, just being in the mountains. I grew up in the mountains in Australia and I love getting back there. Um, and I love, yeah, just spending time in the mountains, I guess. <laughs> Totally. I totally get that. That's amazing. And what's the most exciting thing that's ever happened there? Could you give us one juicy story quickly before we wrap it up? Oh, I, we, it's, it, it, it's an interesting place. You get, to, you get to manage all sorts of interesting things like, you know, it's frostbite and high altitude, um, high altitude cerebral edema, so swelling on the brain and high altitude pulmonary edema, so swelling on the lungs and a Acute mountain sickness. I think one of the uh, one of the funniest people who have high altitude cerebral edema tend to do some silly things, um, and they, they sort of come in a little bit confused about life. And we had a particular gentleman uh, who uh, he he worked in IT, um, and he wanted us, he wanted us to run diagnostics on him. 
uh, like IT diagnostics to prove, because he didn't think that he had high altitude cerebral, cerebral adenal haste. Um, and he, he certainly did. He was staggering all over the place. He was acting like he was intoxicated, which is a clear sort of sign of having it. Um, he thought he was a giraffe at times. So he'd spend time running around our clinics, shouting, I'm a giraffe, I'm a giraffe, get out of my way while I run around like a giraffe. Um, and then, yeah, wanted to, us to connect him up to the computer and run IT diagnostics on him. <laughs> I love it. We get that because, um, you know, being at sea, as you well know, um, you know, you just never know when someone's going to have um, some delusions from seasickness or being so far remote, remote just being out in the wild, you, you know, can be quite threatening sometimes. So, yeah, I, I, I can totally imagine that story. That's, that's a good one. <laughs> so did you hook him up to anything and and yeah, so I mean, the, the key for these guys is descent because they need they need oxygen. So working yeah. at um, five and a half or five thousand six hundred meters at Everest Base Camp, um, you're basically in a low pressure, so what we call a hypobaric, hypoxic, so low oxygen environment. Um, and really, the only way to treat these guys is to to give is to descend down to a higher pressure and more oxygen environment. So any medication, uh, any sort of interventions that we do as doctors is basically um, you're basically replicating the effects of descent. So this guy happened to come in. It was a sunny day. Uh, the weather was good. So we were able to get a helicopter in straight away to basically evacuate him out. And that was the treatment that he really needed. Uh, you know, we can if, if we can't do that, we can put people in hyperbaric chambers. Uh, we have portable hyperbaric chambers at altitude, which we just basically pump up with a foot pump. Um, and that sort of simulates by putting the extra pressure in there um, in, this, in this cylinder, pump up cylinder, um, it simulates uh, descent. And so you can sort of achieve a two to 3,000 metre descent just by putting them in one of these cylinder, one of these uh, chambers. Um, we can give them supplemental oxygen and we can give dexamethasone, which is a type of steroid as well. So we did all of those things while we were waiting for the helicopter. But then we, uh, we got him down and he made full recovery. Oh, <laughs> how exciting. I didn't actually know they had um, blow up. Um, hyperbaric chambers. I'm going to have to get up there and do some mountain medicine. That sounds really yeah. exciting. We could use There's them on the boats. In interesting uh, doctor who lives down in Signet in Tasmania, uh, who owns a sailing boat, spent much of his life on a sailing boat by the name of Jim Duff, uh, who invented the portable altitude chamber. Um, and he yeah, sells one of the products. Really? Right on. We're going to have a chat about that when we catch up. I want to meet this guy too. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for being on the show. Have a great trip. And Thank you very um, much. yeah, enjoy, enjoy the scenery, enjoy the voyage. And I hope you have a really, really boring time medically, <laughs> <laughs> medically speaking. Thank you very much, Amanda. It was a pleasure. Well, we might get you on the show when you get back or when you um, get back to the Himalayas and you can show us around your set up there sometime as well. Yeah, fantastic. It would be my pleasure. Awesome. All right. Thanks, everyone. You're listening to Yachting International Radio with Manda and we'll see you next Monday. Thanks very much, Dr. Brent. Brent, we'll see you really soon.